Howdy y'all and welcome back to Country Fried Minis. I'm your host Cameron, the country boy in the big city, presenting to you once again from my temporary studio location. Now I've come forward today to talk to some of you hobby veterans out there who have undoubtedly painted many models in a set color scheme. And that's what I'd like to talk to y'all about today, matching that color scheme. Face looking all dolled up. Got the Fanus and the Rafik. Got some Shehobs and Shatania. Wait a minute. Not done, but the tournament's in two days. Now, I myself am a connoisseur of a futuristic sci fi skirmish game called Infinity, manufactured by Corvus Belly. They're a small Spanish company have made a really quality game that I've learned to enjoy over the last 10 years or so. In playing that game, I like to get involved in a lot of competitive settings, including local and regional tournaments. I just happened to have a tournament coming up, and I looked over my models and found that I had a couple models unpainted. So I need to match those models to get them painted and on the field and ensure that they're the same color as the rest of them. Firstly, it's important to note that Infinity models are all made of pewter, and thus are going to need some primer like this Steinle Res Gray to get them coated up. This primer doesn't always flow the smoothest out of an airbrush, so I'm also going to use a little bit of water to thin it to the right consistency. Most paints, including this primer, are a little too thick out of the bottle, and gotta have that thinning. Speaking of airbrush, I want to go ahead and talk to you all about the quality of tools at hand. Now, I know airbrushes can be a little expensive, so I went ahead and picked up this real cheap kit off of Amazon. I haven't tested out this here Go Helper off-brand yet, but I'm sure it performs just as well as the discount brand Master, which is available on Amazon. I'll provide a link below in the description. In addition to the airbrush itself, you're also going to need an air hose, as well as a compressor, to make it work. This here complete set was less than 60 bucks total. And even when the airbrush breaks down, the hose and the compressor will still be fine for the next brush. Now with that waffling out of the way, I want to show y'all the right consistency to thin your paints to. As you can see, I've went ahead and put some paint directly into the pot, and I'm going to go ahead and add about 10 drops of water to thin it down to a nice consistency that will flow smoothly. Here you can kind of see the consistency is about like that of whole milk. Next, we're going to put our finger over the tip of the airbrush and we're going to go ahead and pump some air through it by pressing down on the trigger and pulling back. This will force air back up into the reservoir and bubble it up and help mix it up into a smooth consistency. Of course, now that I'm ready to paint, I've done forgot a glove. So I'm going to pause the video and slap on a glove to keep my left hand from getting super dirty during this process. Once gloved up, I'm going to go ahead and hold the model in one hand while spraying at it in light passes from all kinds of different angles until it's got a smooth and even coat of primer all over its entire surface. It's real important to do this in small passes so you don't overdo it and cause any loss of detail or runny spots in the paint. You've just got to remember to be steady and patient and do it little at a time until it's done just right. Before you know it, you'll have a nice smooth coat of primer over that metal model and it'll really help prevent any chipping in the future as you handle your models when you're playing. With the priming out of the way, we can go ahead and start base coating up this model, which of course is going to start by rehydrating my wet palette. Whenever I'm done painting and I know I'll be done for a couple days, I always let this sponge completely dry out to help reduce any kind of mold buildup that could potentially happen in such a moist environment. For some reason, I always find this part real satisfying while I watch this sponge rehydrate after applying water to it. Now that the palette's hydrated and the parchment paper's put down, 
I'm going to go ahead and review the colors I'm going to need for this army scheme. Whenever you're working on a large collection of models that are all going to be the same color, it's good to keep a well-defined and easy to remember palette that's going to be universal between all those models. This here set is real easy to remember with only three primary colors, two accent colors, a wash color, and a highlight color. I've painted with this set so many times I can't even count, but it's real good to have it here in video format so I can quickly reference those colors if I need. With the palette review completed, I'm gonna go ahead and put out a few drops of this here bright magenta paint. Although Plaid's Apple Barrel line is definitely craft paints, I find that they work pretty well for certain colors as long as you thin it down with a few drops of water after you put it on your palette. Although craft paints can generally be regarded to have poor coverage, we're not too worried about that today, as when we're doing the base coat, we're gonna apply that age-old adage of two thin coats. We're not too worried about accuracy here since it's a base coat layer, so we're gonna go ahead and slop this paint over all the portions of the model that will be this one particular color. That being said, it's good to maintain some sense of accuracy here to limit the amount of cleanup you're gonna have to do in later stages. This step can take a little artistic interpretation when you're painting a new model type for the first time, but since I've already done this particular model before, I've got my reference material sitting right next to me the whole time, and I know exactly where all these magenta portions are going. And taking my time and being patient, using that reference material at hand, I'm gonna go ahead and put this paint on in two thin coats and get it over every portion that's gonna be magenta in the final product. Since the paint is thinned down, each of the layers is gonna dry fairly quickly and make this real easy to do. I'd also like to add that since this step is near mindless, it's real good to put on a podcast or some favorite music to listen to while you're working on this portion of the model. Though I generally favor podcasts like Trapped Under Plastic or Paint Bravely, today I'm reminiscing about my teenage hobby years and listening to some classic tracks by one of my favorite bands, Rammstein. Now with the magenta portion completed, we're going to repeat the same task, only using the turquoise paint. I find that this color has much better coverage than the bright magenta, and when you're dealing with a color that has such great coverage, you could, in a pinch, get away with just one coat on certain portions of the model, like the undersides of the legs, or portions that wouldn't be viewed as much as the rest. However, that being said, I'm going to stick to that age-old adage and go with two thin coats. Plus, that buys me more time to sit back and listen to these rockin' classic industrial tracks by one of my favorite bands. Although painting models is at times real tedious, it doesn't mean that it can't be super enjoyable. Plus, tasks like this buy us time to do things that we usually wouldn't do given the amount of visual stimulation that's available out there. There's so little time these days to listen to audiobooks or music or podcasts that finding a nice relaxing task like this can allow for some sweet listening time. Which holds true as long as we choose entertainment that requires just listening. As sometimes you do need to focus and kind of thread the needle and paint real tight portions on the model. Finally I'm going to put out some of this Mechanicus Standard Gray and apply it to the guns and the targeting system on this model. I'm going to go ahead and apply this paint at full strength but I'm only doing that because it's a Citadel Air color, which is already pre-thinned, enough even to spray through an airbrush. Even though I started with a gray primer, it's not quite the right tone to match the other models, and I'm gonna just go ahead and apply the same color like I've done for the rest of them. Although this could be construed as a tedious extra step, it's gonna blend in perfectly when set up next to the other models in my force. Finally, with all the base coats out of the way, we're going to go ahead and ink wash the heck out of this model. A lot of paint and tutorials out there will advise against really slopping this stuff on heavy as it can leave ugly tide marks and create real heavy pooling in areas where you don't necessarily want the dark color. For a lot of paint and applications, this holds incredibly true. And unless you're intending to achieve this effect, I would advise against putting this on so thick. However, the warning against slopping this on aside, I really want to achieve that effect with the pooling and the dark collection in the crevices. So I'm going to go ahead and apply this Known Oil by Citadel Colors directly out of the bottle in a real heavy fashion over the entire model. Now, 
Once I've let that heavy saturation completely dry, I'm going to go ahead and reapply my base tones to the portions I've already painted. This is a step that most people will avoid in their painting, but I really like the effect that it creates. The shadows get really deep and rich, and it almost creates a black lining effect between panels. Since I'm not the most accurate painter in the world, this is my preferred method to achieve this real nice black lining effect between the portions of the model. Digressing, we're going to go ahead and thin those paints from the base tone even more than the previous step. I want to keep the paint thin enough to be translucent so that I can see the ink wash portions through the paint. As I slowly layer this base color on and bring it back to the base tone, I'm going to leave it a little thinner in certain points to create some semblance of shadows. On this particular model, the areas where this effect would be most prevalent are going to be sections where the armor joins up but doesn't form a deep crease. Most notably, that's going to be the little flanges on the pink portions of the leg armor. This step is going to require some patience and precision as we go over and over the portions until we built up the desired opacity. For that, I really want to doubly reinforce listening to a podcast or some music. Something where you don't have to put too much focus to follow a plot line and can devote that focus to painting your model. I had a particularly nice go of it myself today. I sat back and got a ton of painting done and let a YouTube playlist of some sweet Rammstein play in the background. What a day. Good audible content is really conducive to getting work done. And I really enjoyed this day. I got a ton of work done despite working in such crowded conditions living in the city and working on a tiny table. Even though I ate a little paint. Oh hi y'all! Now, with the base coats built back up, it's time to go ahead and start highlighting these colors. Lately, I've given up on using white paints except for very specific applications and instead I reach for this here Liquitex white acrylic ink. This stuff is fantastic because just a couple drops into your paint will not only increase the brightness to a highlight color, but also help thin the paint out because of its liquid consistency. With that all mixed up, we're going to go ahead and apply this color to the raised portions of the model. Since we've already done some of the shading with the reapplication of the base tone in translucent tones, we're going to use this color pretty sparingly. I'm going to apply this highlight tone extremely carefully and focus on only the upwards facing portions of armor panels. After all, the whole point of highlights is to create the illusion on a small scale of the interplay between light and shadow. So going around the model, I'm going to apply this tone to the upwards facing portions of the model and feather it out using a moistened tip of the brush after applying. I'm reserving the full strength color for only the sharpest edges on armor panels and areas that would be starkly lit by lighting from above. It's okay to go ahead and apply this first highlight layer in broader strokes as it will only increase the depth when we go back and clean it up with a brighter color. Still, it pays to take some extra care here and not really slop this on. We do want to maintain some accuracy even in applying the broad strokes. And in doing so, we're going to take our time and go around every surface of the model and pick out the best spots to place these highlights. This effort definitely takes an artist's eye and over time, with more practice, you'll only get better at it. Applying highlights and shades will definitely teach you a lot about how volumes interact with light. With all that taken to heart, it's okay if your first highlight isn't super accurate, because again, we're going to go back with the next layer and really clean it up and accentuate the work we've put down. Speaking of that next layer, we're going to go ahead and add three more drops of the Liquitex white ink to this tone and mix it up thoroughly to get our next highlight color. With that color knocked up, we're going to revisit the model and hit all those portions where we put the previous layer before. Only this time, we're going to use even more care and be even more sparing with the application of this color. This second highlight tone needs to be reserved for only the sharpest edges and areas where maybe a specular highlight would be present on the model. After all, if this was applied too thick, it would undo the work for the volumes that the last layer did. We really want to build up a variation in tone, creating a smooth transition to these higher tones. That way it helps increase the illusion of depth on these sharp highlights. Still, that being said, we don't have to be perfect here. When this model is mixed in with the rest of the warband of 15 or so models, 
It's unlikely that anybody's going to pick it up and scrutinize it real hard up close. In fact, it's probably only going to be viewed at an arm's length distance. So after highlighting that magenta up to a good enough standard, we're going to go on to the next color and do a very similar process with the turquoise. First we're going to start with the base turquoise color thinned down so it's nice and transparent and build back up that base tone just like with the magenta. Following the same process, we're going to add a couple drops of this Liquitex white ink to the color to brighten it up and create our first layer of highlight. For all intents and purposes, this step is identical to the previous color. We're just going to add a brighter tone and create highlight layers and rinse and repeat. Wherein we're going to take our time and add this highlight color to the sharpest edges and areas where the sun would be shining directly down onto this model from above. I say sun in this instance because my minis will be modeled as if they're standing outside, but I don't necessarily mean the sun. I mean whatever light source is from above. You could even get pretty creative with the colors you choose to make your highlight tones depending on where you want these models to be in your imaginary space. And again, just like with the magenta, we're going to add a couple more drops of the white ink to this color and brighten it up even further and create a secondary highlight tone that will be used even more sparingly on the sharpest edges of this figure. In the case of these turquoise highlights, I've opted to make them even more subtle than the highlights I put on the magenta layers. Since I've chosen to use the bright magenta as the primary tone for my army, I want to draw a little extra attention to these portions. I've mostly achieved this by using brighter highlights on the magenta portions, causing the eye of the viewer to be drawn to those first. Following the established tactic of building back up the base coat, I'm going to go ahead and put out some more Mechanica Standard Gray and do just that. As this color is the third most important base tone, I'm going to apply it more sparingly than the others. In doing so, I'm going to leave deeper shadows on the base tones, which is especially appropriate since this color is being used on weapons and targeting systems both of which would be much more likely to be corroded, oxidized, or in general grimied up. Finally, I'm going to be even more sparing with the highlight, choosing to only put one layer on to brighten these up. Since these parts are meant to be metallic, they'd be much more likely to receive very sharp highlights from the sun, and thus need much less blending in the transition to the highlight tone. Now with the primary tones all done and dusted, it's time to go ahead and start getting out our secondary colors on these models. I'm going to start with this here Citadel Warboss Green to start coloring up all the lights on this remote. Unusually enough, I'm going to apply this color at full strength to the eyes of this model, as I don't want it to flow out of my control and instead be deposited precisely where I put my brush. Though it is okay if the base color green spills out a little bit to replicate a glow, I want to retain that control as I add the thin and white ink to it. Since it's such a small amount of paint, I'm only going to add one drop of the ink and mix it up, and that's going to create a 50-50 consistency between the white and the green. Since I've kept it so thick, I'm able to apply this in a very controlled fashion at the center of the previous green layers. Combining this precision highlight with the bigger green tone underneath, I'm going to create the effect of glowing green lights all over this model. An effect that will even be noticeable at arm's length or when viewing it from across the table. Finally, I'm going to get out a little bit of this Citadel Mephiston Red and put it on the other lights on this model. Since the red lights are on the back of the model, I'm not only going to apply this color in full strength, but I'm also going to do it in one layer without any kind of highlighting. It's little steps like this, when applied to many models across an army, will save you tons of time and help you to get that full force done in a matching color scheme. You might just be saving a second or two here and there, but when you consider you're painting 20 or more models, it'll really add up. An effect that I'm sure will be even more pronounced if you're playing some kind of hordes army for a game like Warhammer 40,000. Although Infinity is a skirmish game, it's really easy to build up a collection of hundreds of models so that you have the options when making your army lists. Digressing, let's go ahead and seal those colors in so we can handle it while we paint the base. Since Infinity is a game that requires clear line of fire markings on the base, I elect to paint up my base rim in the two colors that are my primary tones. Having sprayed a layer of the Army Painter Anti-Shine Matte Varnish, I'm able to handle this model freely without any worry of damage in the paint. As you may have noticed on my example model at the edge of the frame, I also like to paint a little embellishment that goes all the way around the base rim. 
For that, I'm going to use this Liquitex white ink at full opacity and go around real carefully and paint the pattern in two thin coats as I go around the base. Just a word of caution to y'all out there using this Liquitex white ink straight on. The ink is real fragile and you need to be especially careful when applying this. And finally, I'm going to use this Apple Barrel Hunter Green to apply a base tone to the top of the base before adding flocking. With those details done, comes one of the most important steps on this model. I'm now going to take some of this Windsor & Newton Artist Acrylic Matte UV Varnish and apply it real thick with a brush all over the model. I'm starting with the base here, and again I want to reinforce that this ink is really fragile, so apply this varnish in a really soft stippling motion. And once we've gone all the way around the edge without damaging the white ink too bad, we're going to go ahead and set this model onto a little plinth so that we can paint on it without handling it. In my case, I've just got the lid to the same jar I'm using as a water pot. You could go ahead and let the base rim completely dry before applying varnish to the rest of the model, but since I'm showcasing ways to save time, I'm going to go ahead and use the same portion that I've laid out and go ahead and start brushing it onto the model real thick. That being said, I don't want to apply it far too thick where it'll have a color, and I also want to really avoid getting any air bubbles into the finish. Though this varnish can also be applied through an airbrush, I prefer hand brushing it on because it provides a real robust and heavy duty finish that helps me handle my models for years to come. I especially enjoy the tactile feel that this particular varnish gives models. It creates almost a rubberized feel to the coating of the model, but yet remains transparent enough that it's not going to change any tones on your paint scheme. And once that's dry, we're going to go ahead and just use some PVA glue and smear it all over the surface of the top of the base. Though sometimes you might want to do this separately from painting the model, in this particular case my army is all set out to be in a lush meadow and are just going to receive some real thick flocking around their bases. So I don't mind if a little bit of glue gets on the legs or ankles of my models and stick some fine flocking to them as I dump it all over the base from various angles to ensure smooth coverage. I'll repeat this a few times and tamp it down with the handle of a paintbrush to ensure a lush coating all over the base. We want to make sure that every square inch of the glue is covered with foliage. And now for the final accent on this base, I'm going to go ahead and break off a few pieces of this extra coarse turf. Using a pair of fine point tweezers, I'm going to dip these pieces into the glue and then apply them on top of the rest of the flocking on the base, where they will replicate some kind of small shrubbery or low growing bush to accentuate the base. Now with that final touch, we're going to go ahead and let her dry up and put her on the turntable for some glamour shots. I'll go back in with some flocking in the meantime and fill any gaps in the glue and add some more accents till it looks just right. But for now, this here Shehob Total Reaction HMG remote is ready to hit the field. And with the basing and varnishing done on this model, it blends in mighty nice with the rest of my army. The paint job may not be quite as precise, but I've managed to save a little bit of time in the process. A technique that I'll apply to the rest of the models and make sure they all get done. I hope that y'all have taken something away from today and can use these tips to get your own armies complete. It's always really satisfying to get them all done and get them all looking the same and see the spectacle of everything laid out. And I hope that the people at the tournament will appreciate it as much as I do. In any case, I've been Cameron on behalf of Country Fied Minis. I hope that y'all come back and see what we have in store next time. And as always, I want you to remember to be happy while you're painting. Take it easy, fellas.